to question 47 of the Secunda Secunde. Uh, the topic for this lecture is prudence in and of itself. Uh, this is a this is the first of the cardinal uh, virtues. So this will be an interesting one at starting a whole new section, although this is this is one of the shortest uh, sections of the, the sections on virtues. Um, we'll jump right into it. Starting with the catechism, which I think helps synthesize a lot of what we cover with Aquinas, but it, it brings in the whole context to it, uh, I think help. So prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason uh, to discern our true good uh, in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. A prudent man looks where he is going. Keep sane and sober for for your prayers. Prudence is right, right reason in action. It's important, uh, right? St. Thomas Aquinas following Aristotle. It is not to be confused with timidity or fear, uh, nor with duplicity or dissimulation. It is called the charioteer of the virtues. Now that's an important line, the charioteers of the, charioteer of the virtues. It guides, uh, other virtues by setting rules and measure. Uh, it is prudence that immediately guides the judgment of the conscience. Uh, prudent man determines and directs his conduct in accordance with uh, this judgment. With the help of the virtues, we apply moral principles to particular cases without error and overcome doubts about the good to achieve and the evil to avoid. Um, this is all broken down in the next 16 articles of this um, section, so I won't go into much more detail, but I will reference back to this uh, occasionally. Now, prudence is a cognitive faculty. So this was pointed out in the uh, catechism. It, this is dealing with an uh, intellectual virtue. Um, not based on the appetites, but the cognitive faculty. Uh, a prudent person, in some sense, has a practical wisdom about them, a practical knowledge about them. Uh, they can uh, they can see what is coming ahead. Right, that's some of the language that we use here. Uh, is foreseeing. Uh, Saint Augustine, prudence is the knowledge of what to seek and what to avoid very similar to wisdom, practical wisdom. And St. Isidore of Seville, uh, a prudent man is one who sees as it were from afar, uh, for his sight is keen and he foresees the event of uncertainty. That is a great <laughs> understanding of, of um, prudence right there from St. Isidore. You know, it's prudence is dealing with foresight. You see something coming. You know, when a good driver, when they're going down the road, um, a good driver foresees potential uh, accidents. Uh, driving down, they go, okay, watch out for that car up, up ahead. They don't look like they're paying attention. You know, look out for that pothole that's 100 feet away. You know, look out for the dog that's on the side of the road. It might run in the road to you. You know, just be aware of that. Right? A good driver foresees what's coming, right? A bad driver is one where everything seems to be a surprise. You know, they're driving, then all of a sudden they hit the pothole and they go, whoa, where did that come from? Well, you weren't looking ahead, right? Uh, a dog just ran right in the road in front of my car. Yeah, but that was 500 feet away. You could have seen that dog on the side of the road and you should have slowed down or moved over the lane, honked your horn a little bit ahead of time to give the chance for the dog to run away, right? Good prudence is good foresight, right? And, and this often comes with wisdom and age, right? Uh, a young person, particularly a teenager, they may might not have made many decisions before, important decisions before. Therefore, they don't foresee what's coming, right? Which is often why teenagers might make bad decisions is because they don't have enough wisdom or experience uh, to foresee what might be coming. Right? 
I, I get surprised by things very easily. I can't believe that person cheated on me. Well, you know, your girlfriend lives five states away and you met her online, so, and you're 14. So there's a good chance she's not going to be your wife, right? Any adult might be aware of that, but to a teenager, they might be really shocked when the relationship ends. But they haven't been in many relationships before, so they don't have that prudence, right, to, to, to see what was coming. So prudence is such an important virtue. You know, that idea of the charioteer, you know, the horses are pulling the chariot forward, you know, at high rates, right? but it's the charioteer who could direct that force in the right way. Where the virtues got pulling us in a direction, but it's the charioteer that pulls it in the right direction, that guides it. Not that the charioteer has force him or herself, but that they can direct those who do have force. Uh, sight belongs to the cognitive faculty, right? having that wisdom of foresight, that prudence, you know, this isn't out of the emotions, right? The emotion says, that girl will love me forever, right? That's what the emotions tell you. The intellect tells you, this isn't going to last, right? <laughs> right? The intellect is what tells you um, uh, what's prudent, not the emotions. The emotions often drive us in the wrong direction. Therefore, that we need prudence to properly direct the appetites. You know, to say it's uh, also the intellect, uh, that prudence is related to the intellect rather than the will. The will is another way of saying the appetites, the desires. Now, prudence, uh, practical reason, article two. Uh, prudence uh, is right reason applied to action. Now, this is, uh, again, the catechism takes this from Aristotle and Aquinas here, St. Thomas. Um, it's right reason, so it's the intellect, right reason applied to right action. It is not simply speculative. It's not simply uh, knowing the right thing intellectually or hypothetically. It deals with action itself. Therefore, it's dealing with practical reason, not speculative reason, not what if, you know, not contemplating the nature of God. It's not contemplating high ideals, which is, they're wonderful. Those things, speculative reason is wonderful. But we're dealing with practical, on the ground, everyday uh, uh, uses. Right? This is common sense stuff. This is uh, wisdom. It's in action, life in action. Prudence aims uh, at the action towards some end, uh, which is practical reason rather than speculative reason. Right? Application uh, of an action is the end of practical reason. So it's not aimed at the end. Right? The end deals with speculative reason. Right? If we're looking at what's the end, what's the proper end, let's judge what's the proper end. That's a wonderful thing to judge the proper end. Prudence isn't dealing with what is the proper end. It's you've already determined what the proper end is. Prudence helps you get there, right? You say you're headed to Chicago. Prudence doesn't tell you to <laughs> doesn't tell you to go to Chicago or not. Prudence tells you how do you get to Chicago, right? You get in the car, you get gas, you you drive, you stay overnight in this place or that place. Prudence is what gets you there. Uh, it's not, it doesn't make a determination about the end. The end is another question, dealing with speculative reason. Um, speculative reason discovers, uh, tries to discover what something is. But prudence is about the action, how you get there. Prudence relates to singul singulars. Uh, well, this is another way of saying this, I, and the way I more commonly I say it would be, Particulars, right? It's dealing with something particular. Prudence isn't generalized, uh, right? There is a sense of universal, right? Um, but prudence isn't really about universals. It's about the particular, right? It's about how to get John to where John wants to go. 
right? It's it's about uh, it's not about uh, the philosophy of uh, travel. It's about on this road at this time with this person. How do you do it? Right? It's dealing with very specific things. Therefore, singulars, right? Dealing with singular things things or universal things um, uh, very important right this is all part of that kind of practical reason right it's practical it's not dealing with the big it's dealing with the particular prudence is a virtue article four. we've already gotten through a quarter of the question so we're moving along prudence is a virtue so uh, it's almost Quite obvious that it is a virtue since it's a cardinal virtue. Vir uh, virtue is that which makes uh, the its possessor good. Uh, you know, if I'm a good person. Well, how do you determine who a good person is? Well, a good person has virtues uh, because virtues is what makes a possessor good. Right? And that's how you determine who is good. Uh, virtues. Therefore, uh, uh, prudence. Uh, considers not only that which is materially good, but formally good as well. It directs people with the intentionality of the good. It doesn't just gently come across the good, but it ends the good. Um, therefore, it is a virtue. Uh, prudence uh, has the nature of virtue, not only as the other intellectual virtues, but also uh, the moral virtues. Um, so prudence guides one to uh, right action. And very repetitive, but it's not dealing with intellectual virtues in, a, in the speculative, in the practical. It's dealing with the moral virtues. It's trying to give you the proper means to get there, right? It's the proper means. It's not necessarily about the end, it's about the means. You're dealing with moral virtues. Now is prudence a special virtue? Humorous because whenever St. Thomas asks the question, it's almost always yes, yeah. Uh, but the good part about this section is St. Thomas gives a good summary of what he means by special virtue. And once you move into justice, the next topic, he doesn't quite go into as much detail uh, with what that means, right? You can't say that every time. Um, but any habit that has a corresponding special object from other objects it must be a special habit and if the habit is good then it makes it a special virtue so you have a special object uh, a special uh, habit well that is what prudence does right it, it uh, has a special way of practical reason right it's just it handles things in a special way it doesn't handle it as justice it doesn't handle it as hope or charity uh, it has a special practical reason to get people uh, to their end, right? It is properly the charioteer. Now, not all virtues are the charioteer, um, but prudence is the charioteer. Um, and it's not, and St. Thomas brings up in this section, prudence is about contingent things not necessary things like wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Right? A wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in some sense is dealing with these universals, right? It's, um, it's dealing with universal things, big things. Uh, prudence is not dealing with wisdom in itself, knowledge in itself, understanding in itself. It's dealing with, again, singularities, right? It's dealing with singulars. It's dealing with particular things. Um, you know, particular things in a particular way, aiming for a particular end, right? Because it's so particular, we're dealing with contingent things, right? Uh, things that build on one another to get uh, there, right? This is, um, uh, anyway, we're not talking about universals, but about particular practical things. Um, as a special virtue is distinct from other virtues, right? Prudence is a special way of doing this. That's not like the other virtues. Prudence <clears throat> sets the way, not the end. Again, quite repetitive. Now we're on question six. I feel like I've said this in each of the questions. But again, prudence is not about 
finding the end, right? Different virtues aim at figuring out what the end should be, how, you know, what the end is. Prudence helps you get there, right? Prudence is the way in which we get to the end. Uh, it sets the way and the mode, uh, but not the end itself. Um, the end of moral virtues is human good. Uh, the end of moral virtue uh, must of necessity pre-exist reason. Um, prudence does not uh, appoint the end to moral virtues, but only regulates the means. So, uh, so, so this is dealing again, uh, it's, it's just, it's a way of saying, it, it, it's dealing with practical, the practical aspect of it. It's not dealing, um, with the ideal, it's dealing with the practical, dealing with the means. Now, prudence is also the means of moral virtues, right? This is also brought up a couple questions ago. Uh, the proper end of each moral virtue consists precisely in conformity with right reason, right? Uh, that's moral virtues aim at right reason, right? You are avoiding excesses and deficiencies. It's the proper right mean. It's, the, it's that middle path. Right. Uh, if we look at temperance, it seeks not to stray from right reason by concupiscence. Um, fortitude seeks not to stray from right judgment by by reason of fear. Right. Well, that is their goal. But for prudence, uh, it's to get temperance to. Uh, to right reason. How does temperance get to right reason without being destroyed by concupiscence? Prudence. How does fortitude get to right judgment without being destroyed by fear? Prudence. So prudence is this means, right? It's a, it's a utility, right? It's like the electric company, the gas company, the water company. It exists to provide something of use or other things. Water company doesn't exist for its own sake, but to provide uh, like the utility of water in all of the houses and businesses in, a, in an area, right? It's, it's necessary. It's a, it's a necessary thing, but it's uh, but it's uh, but it doesn't exist for its own sake. It, it's that's a very important purpose, right? None of the other virtues can properly function if they don't have prudence, right? So, this, it's this charioteer, like you can have 50 different horses, but you got to have one charioteer that guides them. That's why prudence is just so important. Prudence determines the right matter and by what means one shall obtain the end. So how does temperance uh, get to right reason? Prudence figures it out, right? Prudence is the way you get there. How does fortitude get to right judgment? Prudence figures it out, and it's dealing with specifics and practical ways of doing it, right? So it's, it's figuring out in every situation, how, did, how does this happen? Now, uh, command is the chief act of prudence. Well, this is a kind, kind of interesting. So prudence uh, is right reason applied to action, right? This, this definition comes up fairly frequently. It was right in the catechism as well. Um, well, there's three parts of right reason applied to action. There's counsel, uh, you know, there's finding information, getting, gaining information from wise people, from the books, from, uh, you know, developing your conscience. Uh, the next is you have to judge that information you get, right? This is all building prudent decisions, right? Prudent person gathers information, they judge the information, and then they make a command which is the action part, right? The action is the most important part of, of prudence. So the chief act of prudence isn't gaining knowledge, right? If you gain knowledge, but you don't do anything with the knowledge, it's not useful. You gain knowledge and you judge the knowledge and you still don't do anything, not useful. The action that makes prudence valuable, right? It's, really takes all three, but the, the chief act, the chief piece of prudence is, uh, is command, command part of it. 
Commanding is the chief act of practical reason uh, and therefore prudence. So solicitude belongs to prudence. Now this kind of works into multiple questions, so we'll introduce it here, but it'll make more sense as time uh, goes on. So solicitude is being skeptical of the information you've been given. So solicitude is asking and gaining information, right? Somebody's being solicitous, they're asking a lot of questions, right? they're, they're knocking on your door. Um, but then you're judging the information, right? Uh, a man is uh, is solicitous through being shrewd and alert, St. Saint, Saint Isidore, a great line, uh, right? You don't believe everything everyone tells you, right? That, that would be part of being prudent. You just go into the car dealership and whatever they tell you, whatever the price they tell you, you just buy the first thing they, they you know, oh yeah, you should get this car and pay this price, right? That would not be a very prudent person <laughs> who just uh, does what somebody tells them to do. Prudence requires you to be a bit shrewd and alert. You say, I wonder what this person's motivation is. I wonder what the real value of this car is. I wonder if this car has any problems. How do you do this? You look online and you look up the Kelly Blue Book and you do um, car facts to see if the car has been in an accident. You shop around to find out uh, if there's any other cars at a better price. You know, is this even the car you want? You look up consumer reports, right? You have to be shrewd <laughs> and alert in order to be prudent in some ways. Otherwise, you're, you're made a fool of by just going along with whatever somebody tells you. Now, prudence keeps most careful watch and ward uh, less by degree of deceived, unaware by evil counsel. Same idea. Right? If you're not careful in watching, um, uh, you're going to have be given evil counsel, wrong counsel, and you're going to take it. Um, prudence is, is to be slow to take counsel, right? might take a lot of counsel, but you're slow to kind of make determinations with that information. You just listen, right? You're gathering information. You're feeling it out. You know, you ask the right questions. You know, you see how they respond, right? This is all part of being prudent, right? A prudent person doesn't just believe anything they hear. They, they make good decisions. Uh, now, this ties into other parts, right? Uh, so, so prudence extends... Uh, to uh, the governing of many. Um, prudence extends to the common good because the common good is connected with one's own good. Now, St. Thomas, even in his time, points out that some people think that prudence doesn't deal with the common good, that prudence is simply personal um, because their good is unrelated to the common good. St. Thomas points out here that the, their own personal good is directly related to the common good, right? It's kind of a challenge to a bit of the libertarian Catholics um, out there because his St. Thomas is definitely not a, a libertarian in, in any way. Um, it's very strong on the common good, right? He probably gets a bit of this from Aristotle. Um, and uh, St. Thomas's reason is, you know, charity doesn't allow you to just worry about yourself. You can't just say, well, I'm only worried about my own good. I don't care about anybody else's good. That, that's really not my concern. <laughs> it's not my problem. Uh, well, charity doesn't allow you to say, I don't care about the, the good of my neighbor. That's contrary to the gospel. So the common good matters. Um, now, prudence does regard the private good as important, but it also considers the common good. Right, the good of the multitude. And St. Thomas's view is that it's real, you know, he's getting this again from Aristotle, a lot of it. Um, the individual good is impossible without the common good uh, of the family, state, or kingdom. Right. Uh, and one of the examples he gives was from Roman um, officers who said, I would rather be poor in a rich empire than rich in a poor empire. You know, how happy are you if you are living uh, in a place which is unsafe, uh, 
violent, there's crime, people are desperate. Uh, in the, uh, if you consider in America today, our poor, and it might be controversial to say, but even our poor, like they don't starve to death. Uh, unless you have some severe mental illness or drug addiction, you probably have some type of housing. You know, the, the government housing, elderly housing, uh, you know, HUD housing, there's, there's a lot of housing out there. There's welfare checks, unemployment checks, disability checks, right? There, there's all types of checks that are out there. You know, the people who end up on the street end up being people who have other issues where they can't quite make use of the social programs that best help them. But um, to be poor in the United States is better than being rich in many other countries. That are, you know, a rich person in Brazil might be rich, but might be murdered walking down the street. Um, you, know, you could be shoot up your car and kill your whole family just because you, you know, you're driving a nice car and they want to steal what you have. Right? So you could be rich in a poor country. It's worse than being poor in a rich country. Right? Uh, there might be more security for you. So the the common good matters, right? You can say, well, all I care about is my money. Well. You know, you take for granted some of the, the goodness of the stability of the country you have. If, if you're American or European, sometimes you take for granted some of the stability that we have. You think, oh, you think oh, I don't need anybody else, but you really do, right? <laughs> you really do. Uh, you know, you really want those good car, you know, the good roads. You want people to stop at traffic lights and uh, Fire departments, police departments, and you want people to not kill you and steal from you. You know, there's things we, we take for granted that without them we would be much less happy. Um, also, St. Thomas points out that you know, parts are in relationship to the whole. Right? There's, there's no way that uh, you know. There's no way to really be happy without some sense of the good of the whole. Prudence and the common good. Again, ties together. Uh, there are different species of prudence corresponding to these different ends. So, yeah, so there are different ways of being prudent, right? There, there is individual prudence and communal pr prudence, as uh, Article Ten pointed out. You know, they're related, but there, are, there is difference in species within prudence. So, there is prudence, which we just call prudence, uh, which is individual, which uh, is directed to one's own good carry a tear within your own life. But then there's also, maybe one step out, there's domestic prudence, which is directed at the common good of the home, which is important as well, right? You kind of take a step up. If you are prudent, but your husband or wife spends all your money <laughs> and, and uh, is impractical, or your children are impractical, right? Or the husband, and the, practical, right? If, if you do things, if the family is not working together, planning ahead, then then you can lead to your own disaster again, right? And then there's political prudence, which is the, the other big one. Um, this is directed at the common good of the king, good of the kingdom, the political meaning of the polis, of the city, right? Uh, the good of the city, the common good. And they're all related, right? They're all a form of prudence, but they're three different species of prudence. They're not all carried out in the exact same way. Now, is it only rulers that need prudence or do subjects also need prudence? Uh, well, here we are. Prudence <laughs> is in the reason, is in the reason. About the quality uh, necessary for rulers, right? But one of the most important qualities a ruler has is good reason, practical reason, right? How to get your vision into reality, right? With some of these Hollywood uh, people wanting to be president or governors, you know, they, some of the things we've learned is that some of it is, is more than vision and more practical reason, right? Uh, would Oprah do a good job as president? Well, in my opinion, probably not. And not because she's not a good person, right? That's not because she's not a good person. Not because she might not have good ideas. 
but a good politician is somebody who can take the abstract idea and create, uh, you know, turn it into a law, uh, get enough consensus to get it through Congress, get it through the Senate, and to get it on your desk to sign it, and then put it into practical application within the state. Right? This is an art form, <laughs> right? This is you can we can take it for granted. Oh yeah, you just you know, if I were president, I would do this. Well. Not enough just to have an idea. Right? Uh, to be a politician is an art form in some ways, right? And um, and it's based on practical reason, right? Can you make action, right? That's the heart of being a good politician is action. Many politicians agree on the on certain ideals, but they can't make it into action. So, um, you know, if a person can bring it to action, then they have a particular gift. Now, this gift that a politician might have, or ruler might have, might be different than what a subject might have. Now, this, we're talking politics, the polis, but this is true in a corporation, right? The person who's a great cashier might not make a great CEO, and a CEO might not make a great cashier. These, these might be different gifts that a person has. Um, but, uh, so in, in some ways, uh, prudence is more appropriate for a ruler. However, even subjects of a kingdom, even slaves of a kingdom, um, they still have to make good judgments within their own lives, right? They still have to, to, to uh, rule over something in and of themselves. Even if a person were an outright slave, they still have to make prudent decisions within their own life. Even slaves have to make prudent decisions in their own life. Um, there's no getting around prudence. Um, I apologize for anyone who I speak about slaves too loosely, but you know, reading enough Aristotle and, and uh, the ancients, this is how they talk about it. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not triggered by it, you know, they, they're just talking about it. So I apologize if anyone is bothered by it, but I'm just using their context. Um, now, St. Thomas points out, and this is an important in the, uh, at the end of this uh, answer, that rulers um, use prudence in the ma manner of a mastercraft, and subjects use prudence in the manner of a handicraft. Right? Uh, this, uh, I think, is a good image. A, a master, whatever it is, you know, a master. Uh, driver, a race car driver, a master driver, they have a, a particular skill. They can really drive. Well, I can drive too, but not like they could drive, right? I can drive from point A to point B. I can drive to the grocery store. Uh, I can drive to the bank. I can drive to work. I can drive to my parents' house. I can drive to see a friend. I can drive in a, in a useful way, in a utilitarian way handicraft, but uh, a race car driver can really drive, right? They drive in a master craft. It's different. So what we've considered, do sinners have prudence? Uh, this is Article 13. Uh, the St. Thomas says, well, there's threefold ways of looking at prudence. So the first one is false prudence, uh, which doesn't set it off on the right track. Right off the bat, saying false prudence, uh, it disposes well of such things that are fitting for an evil end. Right, uh, in some regards, even uh, evil requires virtue in order to make itself um, effective. Right? Uh, if, if a criminal you know, didn't have perseverance and they didn't have any intellect, right, they wouldn't be very good thief. Right, so uh, things can be good. Virtues can often be used uh, both for good and for bad uh, in some regards, uh, if, if, depending on how they're used, depending on the end that they aim at. Um, but just simply as a means, sometimes they can be uh, used in the wrong way. So for example, a good robber, uh, so a prudent robber would say, um, let me go ahead of time to the bank and uh, see what the security system is, you know, check out when the security guard takes his break, 
um, you know, see how many people work in the bank, see how much money they have in the bank, you know, organize uh, getaway cars and disguises and uh, ways to launder the money afterwards, right? The, the prudent person really, you know, sees ahead the problems that will happen if we rob the bank, right? Um, uh, trying not to get caught. The, the, these are all in some sense prudence, but they're false prudence because they are not aiming at a good end, but an evil end. Um, so uh, in, in that regard, a, a sinner can have prudence in terms of false prudence. Now then the second type is true prudence, which is prudent because it's aiming at a good end. Uh, it devises a, a fitting way to obtain a good end. That sounds like prudence. It's imperfect prudence because it aims either too uh, narrowly or, or yeah, it, 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 it usually fails by aiming too narrowly. So a person can be a prudent businessman or a prudent sailor. So a good business person might, you know, being good at business is a good end, you know, driving the boat into port might be a good end, right? If you're a captain of a ship, that would be a good end. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't lead to one's final happiness, right? It's not really leading one to beatitudo. Um, it's just in a practical sense, right? This is very utilitarian, right? Just driving to the grocery store. It's uh, doing something is good, but not it's not aimed at the highest end. And, and in other aspects of life, one could be quite bad, right? <laughs> one could be quite... Uh, evil right in other ways so it's not necessarily leading to the any type of ultimate good but it's still good right it's aiming the, that particular act is aiming at a particular good end um but it's narrow right it's, it's very narrow the last is the and in that regard a third a prudent person could be a um a, a prudent person a sinner could be a prudent person in a, in that regard, right? Um, a person could be a great business person, but they could be cheating on their spouse, right? for example, or uh, they could be a murderer. Uh, they're good, at, but they're a good business person. Right? There's a lot of different ways. Uh, so in that, that particular way, they could be good, but in other ways, which might even be more important, they could be evil. So um, in that way. A, person could be a sinner and still have some prudence, right? They're not completely devoid of prudence. Um, now, in the third way, uh, it's true and perfect prudence. Uh, it takes counsel, judges, and commands. For, remember, those are those three parts of prudence. Um, uh, commands the means to a good end of a person's whole life. So it's dealing with, uh, again, now the whole picture, right? The, the whole way, looking at sanctification. I'm a saint. Um, now, in this regard, if a person is using prudence to direct oneself towards the good end of their whole life, uh, then they cannot be in mortal sin, uh, because if they cared about it, the good end of their whole life, they would repent. Right? They, they, what good would it be to do all these other things if you were still damned? Right? You would have to, you'd have to put them in the proper order. And no longer be a sinner if you were aiming at the, the final end, right? the, the, whole, the whole life. Now, prudence uh, is contained in grace. We're starting to wind down question 14, article 14 of 16. So uh, there is this one's a bit more complicated, but there's no grace without virtues. That That is a, a uh, first, first statement. There is no grace without virtue. Uh, now, one can be virtuous. Uh, no one can be virtuous without prudence because prudence guides the other virtues, right? Directs the other virtues. It's the charioteer that's guiding the horses, which are the other virtues. Now, uh, so you, you can't have grace without the virtues, and you can't have the virtues without prudence. Therefore, you can't have grace without prudence, right? So it's just one of these logical three-step arguments. Uh, now, whoever has grace uh, has charity. Right? 
So, and charity guides the virtues, and, and charity guides the virtues towards charity, rather than charity guides virtues towards their final end, which is love. So, uh, also charity and prudence go hand in hand. Charity uses prudence to guide the virtues towards a good end. So, uh, they, they go hand in hand. So prudence uh, is not from nature. Winding down even more, right? Uh, so prudence is not from nature. Nature, intellectual virtue is both originated and fostered by teaching, uh, and therefore demands experience and time. So experience and time is not innate. It takes time. <laughs> it takes experience, right? So um, a person is not born with a uh, with fully developed virtue of prudence, right? Uh, Intellectual virtues take work. Therefore, uh, practical reason uh, is acquired through discovery and through experience or teaching. Um, again, practical reason is right actions, right? Making good actions, right decisions, and acting in the right way comes with experience, comes with learning. Um, and St. Thomas, in uh, his response to Objection 2, had a great line I wanted to repeat. Prudence is rather in old, is rather in the old, not only because of their natural disposition, but the calm movements of the sensitive passions. They're not driven by their passions as much. Probably he means as sexual or desires to acquire wealth or acquire power. But if you're older, you, you've let go of that by now. Um, so you're not driven by your, your sensitive appetites. You're, you're driven more by calm, collective, uh, which allows you to ponder on natural reason. Right? Uh, and because of their long experience, so you know they, they don't make fast decisions um, based on their emotions, uh, and they have more experience to be based on. So because of this, prudence in some sense, it's natural for human beings as they get older. Right? In some sense, it is natural, right? It's natural. It's, it would be unnatural for an old person to still be foolish, right? This, that their whole lives has gone by and they've learned nothing, right? They have no experience and they have discovered nothing. That would be unnatural. That would be, no, that would be weird. So in some sense, it is natural to human beings to grow in prudence with time, um, but it's not natural to nature itself. Uh, it is not born with fully developed prudence. It takes time. Self-inspection too, right? Uh, things like confession, things like that, examine of conscience, things like a good spiritual director, Teacher, right? These are these are people who can help get you that prudence faster. Um, you know, some people do get older and they never quite get prudence, but uh, the the goal is that you do. Um, but it comes with work, right? It's an intellectual virtue. Uh, and the the last article, Article sixteen, uh, prudence is not forgotten. Uh, kind of an interesting question. We're going from old age to forgetting. Perhaps it's going in chronological order. Um, prudence uh, consists not of knowledge alone. It's not based on knowledge alone, but also an act of the appetite because its principal act is one of command. Um, so, uh, you know, if a person forgets in their old age, they forget certain things, it doesn't change their wisdom. It doesn't change their prudence because probably their prudence is not based on one single thing, right? Uh, one is not wise because of one single thing, but a collection of, of life experiences, right? Uh, you would have to forget everything, right? Uh, not just one thing. Um, uh, St. Thomas says the thing that really destroys prudence isn't forgetfulness of knowledge, but uh, corruption of the past. What causes us to be imprudent? The emotion. Right? What causes somebody to fall in love with uh, the wrong, the wrong guy? Uh, 
their emotions, not their reason. Their reason tells them run, <laughs> but their emotions say, but he's so sweet, you know, but he's so cute, you know, but I really like him, right? It's the emotions, it's the appetites that get you in the wrong direction. It's not forgetting <laughs> something um, because it's not ultimately about a particular piece of knowledge. Well, St. Thomas does point out in this response to objection three, forgetting the knowledge of the universals does not destroy the principal part of prudence, but hinders it somewhat, right? The more you forget, the less prudent you might become, right? If a person has Alzheimer's, for example, and they have forgotten many things, they are reverting back in age because they don't have many memories of, the, of their entire lifetime, well then, well, then they, they, they will be, have less prudence, right? If you have forgot, ultimately forgotten the last 60 years of your life, the last 40 years of your life, you aren't forgetting a single piece of knowledge, but decades of wisdom uh, are being uh, eroded through something like Alzheimer's. The person might not be as prudent, right? That, that's when people often... You know, they can make bad decisions because they don't have all their, their wisdom about them any longer. And perhaps sometimes the appetites start flaring up again, right? It could be anger, it could be fear, right? Somebody, especially if they're forgetting, they might get afraid and they might react to that the fear and anger, right? And the anger is very strong, but their rationality and their, their knowledge might be um, of the last few decades might be diminished, right? So you know, a disease like Alzheimer's might put it a bit further, but, you know, in a general sense, just simply becoming forgetful isn't enough uh, to undo prudence. Although it's an intellectual virtue, it's also practical reason, not, not knowledge itself, right? It, practical reason is more like common sense rather than, um, uh, knowledge. <laughs> this is a long conclusion. Ah. Okay, <laughs> in conclusion, the 16 articles of prudence in itself. Uh, prudence is, I can't even see it, it's become too small, I apologize. Uh, prudence is, is in reason rather than in the will. Uh, it is an act of the intellectual intellect, not an act of the appetites. Uh, prudence is not only uh, is only in practical reason. Right? It's practical. It's not in the speculative, but it's in practical actions. Uh, prudence, prudent acts uh, are in the singular. Right? We're not dealing with universals, but we're dealing with particular situations things that are contingent uh, on certain times, places people, relationships, activities, right? It's aiming at the end, but in a particular way. Right? Prudence is itself a virtue because it aims at the good, right? If the person possesses it, they become good. Uh, prudence is a special virtue because it's dealing with special acts, right? The, the role of the charioteer is a particular way in which it is a virtue. It's not the same as justice same as other types of virtues it's in a particular way. Um, prudence is about the mean. It's about getting a person to the end, but the means by which a person gets to the end. Uh, prudence fixes on the means of moral virtues, right? So uh, moral virtues deal with some type of means in the middle, avoiding excess and deficiency. Uh, prudence helps you be that balancing act helps you get the other virtues to their um, to their moral state, right? Uh, boasting is too much, irony is too little. Prudence helps you hit that mean of truthfulness. Right? So, uh, prudence is required in all of the virtues in order to hit the golden mean within moral virtues. Uh, prudence, uh, proper act is command, its chief act is command. So um, command is about action, right? It's not about counsel and judgment. Other virtues also deal with counsel and judgment, but this is dealing chiefly with the action. Therefore, it's, it's chiefly based on 
end. Um, solicitude belongs to prudence, solicitude is being uh, skeptical about what people tell you, it's being a bit shrewd with what people tell you, uh, it's listening a lot, prying a lot, gaining knowledge a lot so that you can make a good judgment. Right? It, it doesn't just believe the first thing somebody tells them. Um, prudence extends to governing, right? Prudence in one sense is about the individual, but a, a prudent leader uh, is necessary, right? Prudence is based in reason and the a good ruler is one who is making decisions based on reason and practical reason, right? Pra right? Not in a hypothetical sense, but in a practical way, practical reason and action. Um, there are various species to prudence, right? There is prudence for the individual, prudence for domestic prudence for the household, and then there's political prudence for the common good. Different types of prudence. Prudence uh, is in rulers and in subjects. So uh, this in not in rulers as a master craft, like a expert driver, an expert skier, you know, a ski racer. Um, this in subjects in terms of a uh, handicraft, right? I can't really build a house from scratch, but I can change a doorknob, <laughs> right? So in that, that regard, right, I can, I can, I'm not a master driver, but I can drive a car. I, I'm not a ski racer, but I can get down the hill uh, without falling. So, you know, I have practical skills with it. Um, I have prudence, but really prudence expertly used is for rulers, uh, you know, princes, and politicians, corporate, you know, corporate leaders, uh, heads of household, right? People who have some type of leadership role is, is particularly necessary. Um, uh, perfect prudence is, is not for the wicked, right? It can be uh, false uh, prudence where, you know, even a robber needs to have a certain degree of prudence in order to be a good robber. But uh, perfect prudence is aiming at the end, right? The, the good end for the whole person, right? the, whole, the whole end. Uh, therefore, if you are a wicked person, you can't have that type of prudence. That's only for people who are aiming at the good. Um, um, prudence is in the good, right? You can't really be, you can't have the other virtues functioning well without prudence guiding them, right? It's a very necessary virtue. Um, and prudence is not natural to people uh, in and of itself. Uh, prudence is gained with experience and reflection and, uh, and uh, teaching and time. Prudence comes with time. Right. A, a, a child is not born with prudence. A, a, prudent, a child is very foolish. Right? They, they trust everyone. You know, they, they believe anything, right? A child believes anything. An older person is more prudent because they have more experience. Uh, but so it is natural for humans with time and, and experience to uh, become prudent. It's natural for humans to do that. But it's not innate uh, quality of humans. Uh, and prudence is not lost by forgetfulness in of itself. If you forget enough, you might become imprudent. Um, but, uh, prudence is not from a particular single piece of knowledge, you know, where you forget one thing, now you're no longer prudent. But, um, uh, but if you forget enough, you might, right? In terms of Alzheimer's or something like that. And, um, you know, really where prudence goes wrong is not a lack of the right knowledge. Usually it comes from heightened appetites. It's our lust and our emotions which cause us to uh, put good prudence by the wayside. Um, it, it, we know what the right thing is to do. It's the emotions that get in the way. I know that to lose a little bit of weight and to keep the, you know, the weight off, I got to not eat more of those M&Ms, but it's my, it's my emotions, it's my appetites that are causing me to grab another handful of those M&Ms every time I go to the freezer, right? So uh, it's, not, it's not a lack of knowledge, <laughs> it's a, a, a lack of 
of will. Okay, so this was a very long section, um, but uh, we'll move on to more of Prudence. See you next time.